Hello everyone! Scikit-learn just got so much faster, you're not gonna believe it. It is now running on a brand new GPU engine powered by NVIDIA QML. And today, we will explore it in great detail. So, in this video, we will connect to a free GPU on Google Colab and we will use it for training on the biggest dataset that Scikit-learn has. Now, the best part is, we will do it with zero code changes. Just good old Scikit-learn, but much, much faster. In addition, we will see a whole bunch of benchmarks with different parameters and on different systems and therefore the laptop is here. I will also show you specific use cases where CPUs cause a giant bottleneck. And then the only thing that makes computational sense is switching to GPU processing. So are you ready? Let's roll! So first of all, let's set up our environment in Google Colab, and this is actually much easier than you think. We'll just switch to GPU processing with runtime, followed by change runtime type, selecting the Tesla T4 GPU option. Let's click it, and then let's click on save. And now the only command we need for our setup is percentage symbol load underscore ext, as in load extension, followed by qml.axel. Let's give it a run. And boom! Scikit-learn now officially runs on GPU all the way through the notebook. We can just import it right below with import sklearn, and we can use it like we usually would, just a little bit faster or actually a lot faster, as you will see shortly. Now, alternatively, if you have a GPU at home, you can set up the same environment on your local system. For this, we will navigate to our WSL terminal, and inside it, we will type NVIDIA-SMI. And here, we will make sure that we have the latest driver installed, and we will also make a note of our version of CUDA. Then, we will navigate to the official RAPIDS installation guide, we will scroll down, we will select our version of CUDA 12.8 in my case, and we will choose a specific package of QML. Now, on my end, I will also select the Jupyter Lab IDE, and please feel free to select any package you'd like from this list, they will all be optimized to work on GPU. And then once we are done, let's quickly copy this command, which is generated, and let's paste it inside our WSL terminal. And actually, let me enlarge the font. Now, on my end, I will also rename this environment from rapids25.4 to qml underscore env. It's just a bit easier to remember. And then finally, once the environment is set up and activated, we will simply pip install scikit-learn. And boom, once again, our local environment is now ready for machine learning. But what kind of workflows are more suitable for GPU processing? Well, generally speaking, anything that involves lots and lots of calculations in parallel is the bread and butter of GPUs. CPUs, on the other hand, are incredible at performing one task at a time. So let's quickly see three use cases where GPUs outperform CPUs. Now, use case number one where GPUs really shine is when you have a lot of data. There are too many rows and too many columns to just casually process them one after the other. So when it comes to massive data structures, we process them in parallel on GPU. Now let's start with our scikit-learn workflow from the previous tutorial with a slight change of data sets. So instead of dealing with California housing, we are now dealing with the giant cover type dataset. And this one has 54 columns and over half a million rows, which is pretty big. And if you're not sure what cover type means, it basically tracks the types of trees and bushes that grow in different patches of forest. So the targets of this dataset could be one of seven kinds of cover types. So willow trees, pine trees, and so on. Which means that we are trying to guess a class rather than a continuous value. So what kind of tree is this instead of how much does it cost or how much will it cost in the future? And that's why instead of dealing with regression, we are dealing with classification. 
And these are the only changes in code. So if you watched my previous scikit-learn tutorial, you know exactly what's going on here. But if you haven't, please watch it only after this video is over and I will share a link at the very end. Just don't go yet. Now let's see how much time our training takes if we perform it on CPU. Now, to be fair, in addition to training, which happens here, we are also defining our model and splitting our data set to training and test samples. And we do it at the same cell. But since we will repeat it both for our GPU and our CPU, this is still fair, okay? Now, to make sure that we are running on CPU, let's switch our runtime. There you go, we are now back on CPU. And then we will avoid loading our QML extension because we will need a GPU for that. And then right below, we will of course load our data set just like earlier. And then in our training cell, our training and friend cell, we will add the magic command of double percentage symbol time to the very top. And this will help us track the speed of our CPU performance. Let's give it a run. I hope you're ready. And finally, after two minutes and 17 seconds, our training is complete. But now the million dollar question is, how does it compare to training on GPU? For this, we will switch back to our GPU runtime. There you go. We are officially back. And this time we will load our QML extension first. Then once again, we will load the data set. Then we will copy the entire code from our training cell and we will paste it below just so we don't lose the output of our CPU right over here. Okay, so are you ready? Let's give this cell a very nice run on GPU. And after nine seconds only, we are getting our output. Amazing. So instead of 137 seconds on CPU, we are now processing the exact same data for nine seconds on GPU, which is roughly 14 times faster. Now, let's see if we can make this gap even bigger with use case number two. Now, another area where GPUs really shine is complex algorithms. And even though random forest is not particularly simple to begin with, let's try to complicate it even further. So first, let's increase the number of trees with n estimators. And instead of setting it to the default 100, we will set it to 500 of them. Additionally, we will set the max features attribute to 1.0, which means that every tree in our model will look at each of the 54 features every time it makes a decision, where usually some of these features are ignored to allow a bit more randomness. But now we are forcing the algorithm to include absolutely 100% of the features and therefore 1.0. Great, so with these parameters, let's see the type of results we get. And first, we will start with a GPU because we are already connected. So let's give it a run. And after one minute and 28 seconds, we are finally getting our GPU output. Now let's see how it compares to CPU. But before you run it on your end, here's a quick warning. I ran it earlier off camera and it took me 53 minutes to get an output. Okay, now you can verify it on your end and make sure that what I'm saying is correct. But please keep in mind that it will take you quite some time. Now, since I feel like I waited more than enough, I'm not gonna film it once again and wait once again in front of the camera. I'm just gonna go and compare the performance gap. So in my case, I have 53 minutes times 60 to convert it into seconds. And then I have one minute, which is 60 seconds plus 28 of them. Now let's wrap it in some brackets and let's see the verdict. And there you go. Our GPU is 36 times faster than our CPU, at least when it comes to this task. Yikes. Now, if we run the same notebook on my local system where I have a much better CPU and a much better GPU, then from 53 minutes, we reduce the CPU execution to 3 minutes and 45 seconds. Wow, 
So a very good CPU indeed. Now, when it comes to our GPU, we increase the performance from 1 minute and 28 seconds to 30 seconds only, which is roughly seven and a half times faster than our local CPU. And the idea is, the more we intensify the algorithm, then the bigger the performance gap we will get. So for example, let's increase the number of trees from 500 to 1000. Let's give our GPU another run. And after 42 seconds, we get our results. Now, when it comes to our CPU, let's quickly restart the kernel. And then at the very top, we will avoid loading our QML extension and we will load our dataset instead. Then we will increase the number of trees for our CPU as well. Let's increase it to 1000 and let's give this cell a quick run. Hopefully quick, we don't really know. Now, to give it a fair chance, I will even turn off my OBS studio. Okay, let's stop. And after a very long wait of 7 minutes and 43 seconds, we finally get our local CPU results, which is roughly 11 times slower than our local GPU. So the performance gap has increased for sure. Now, if you're curious, I've prepared this very nice benchmark chart that summarizes the results across two of my systems. You have my Legion laptop as well as my Rogue costume build. Now, if you'd like to run the same benchmarks on your end, you can find my special Jupyter Notebook on GitHub, so just clone it and then run it on your system. Now, there's one thing I've noticed on my end, and it's a slight reduction in accuracy when it comes to GPU processing. Now, the reason is not because it runs too fast or because it skips a bunch of steps. No, I actually verified with the Rapids team. It's because QML and Scikit-learn use different default parameters for things like max features and max depth. Now, even though we've specified max features, we did not specify max depth. And that's why we have a change in accuracy. So if you want to make it really apples to apples, if you don't want to have 96% accuracy on CPU and then 89% accuracy on GPU, then just specify a consistent max depth and set it to some kind of integer on your end. Now, lastly, the biggest performance gap between CPU and GPU is when there's both a giant data set and a giant algorithm. Now, you may think, Maria, this is big enough. How much bigger can we go from here? Well, how about if we increase our number of columns with polynomial features, which is a very common practice, and we discussed it in the previous tutorial. So we will take our existing 54 columns, we will then square them and add them to the mix, and in addition, we will multiply each column by another. And then in the end of the process, we will end up with 1540 columns instead of 54 of them. Now, to spare you the trouble, here's an expanded chart that includes polynomial features. And in fact, you will get the exact same chart if you run my benchmarking notebook. And here, we see that the biggest performance gap is in cases where polynomial features are on and our max features attribute is set to 100%. Huh. Okay, so now that we know the benefits and limitations of our hardware, is there anything interesting that you discovered on your end? If so, please let me know in the comments below. And also, please take a moment to share your benchmarks with other viewers. We all have completely different hardware, so it would be really cool to see your combinations. And also, it is the perfect time to watch my Introduction to Scikit-Learn tutorial, where I show you a step-by-step -step machine learning workflow. So if you click on the card somewhere on the screen, it will take you there immediately. And thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful, please share it with the world. And don't forget to leave it a huge thumbs up and all kinds of comments. Now, if you'd like to see more videos of this kind, you can always subscribe to my channel and turn on the notification bell. I'll see you soon in an awesome tutorial. So in the meanwhile, bye-bye.